Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, not in Baltimore, unfortunately, but at least online. Um, so, yeah, so this session's on the use of um, slag cement together with Portland limestone cement. And the reason for doing this is to reduce the CO2 footprint is one reason. The other one is to improve the properties of concrete. Now, how do I get this? Okay, but I'll start off in general. Concrete's a very sustainable material. Amongst other materials, it has the lowest embodied carbon and energy footprint of any construction material on a mass basis. It uses local materials, so there's not a lot of transportation involved relative to other materials. And a properly designed and executed has a long service life and it is recyclable. And people are getting more and more into recycled concrete. If they're designed for durability, then we, and we get left, better life cycle sustainability, we'll, we will do that through a less, uh, longer service life and less repair. Now, the reason I said that the lowest carbon footprint, if you look at all the materials, this is from the Bath University in the UK, um, where they collected all data on different materials, embodied energy on the y-axis, um, sorry, embodied carbon on the y-axis, embodied energy on the x-axis. If you look at all the materials on a mass basis, um, you see that plastics are way up at the top, steels up, near the, up here in the green, even wood is way up here. People think the wood is sustainable, but it has significant embodied CO2 and embodied energy. What's down at the bottom is concrete in this blue banana at the bottom. Now cement's further up, because cement, but cement's only a component of concrete. So when we take it into concrete, it becomes very low. So why is this a problem? The problem is we use 20 billion tons of concrete a year. It's the most widely used material on earth. So therefore the global impact of using concrete is about 5% of the global CO2 emissions and 3.8% of the energy emissions. But concrete is used also because it's cheap. This is a graph of all materials being used price per ton, and this is somewhat dated, it's a few years old, versus annual production in tons per year. And what you see is concrete is the most widely used material, but it's also the cheapest material amongst other materials. And you can see it falls on a pretty straight line about cost. So if you raise the cost of a material, it will become less uh, uh, likely to be used in large quantities. So it's all about relative performance and, and, um, and uh, competition. Okay, so what's the deal with cement? Cement's the prime, Portland cement has been the primary binder, will probably continue to be the primary binder for some time in, con in normal concrete. And part of that deal is, and about two thirds of it actually, is the fact that we're taking limestone, which is calcium carbonate, heating it up and turning it into calcium oxide and releasing CO2. And the calcium oxide goes on to react with silica and alumina to form the, the cementitious compounds in Portland cement clinker but the CO2 emissions are tied to the breaking down the limestone. And this is unavoidable if we're gonna use calcium-based cements. And this is a graph that I borrowed from Larry Sutter, I'm not sure the origin of it, but what it shows here is the CO2 emissions on the y-axis versus energy and heat consumption. What it says, this brown part at the bottom is CO2 emissions from breaking down the limestone. Now, the type of cement plant affects the other part, how much fuel is used to make the, each ton of cement. And what you find out is that the efficient dry kilns um, uh, are much lower than the old efficient, inefficient wet kilns. Now, most people have got away from wet kilns. They've gone to more efficient wet kilns. Wet kilns are almost gone now with a few instances. There's certainly none left in Canada. Um, and so we're pushing down here. They've, they've really reduced the energy consumption from the fuels used to make cement. But we're stuck with the CO2 burden at the bottom from breaking down limestone. But when you get to, that's only the cement. As I said, cement is just a component of the concrete. So when you look at ready-mix concrete, it's a bit dated, this thing, but it hasn't changed much. Of all, if you take a Portland cement concrete, 90%, 96% of the CO2 burden of a normal concrete mix is from the cement that went into the concrete. So the aggregates and everything else, transportation only plays they have a tiny bit of this. When you look at embodied energy associated with the product, it's 85% is associated with the cement. So 
cement dominates the CO2 emissions from Portland cement concrete. And of course, if we um, reduce by using slag, replacing some of the cement, we will reduce that. And if we had make Portland limestone cement, we have less clinker in the cement. And so this is where the cement industry is going. Um, is again, the two major sources are limestone decomposition and fuel consumption. And since 1972, cement plants have reduced their CO2 emissions by about a third just by improving the efficiency of their kilns and using uh, waste fuels and more efficient plants. So further reduction, they're, they're at the point now where they can't do much to improve the efficiency of the kilns anymore. But what you do is want to reduce the clinker content of the cements being used. So we can do that through blended cements, Portland cements blended with SCMs to make blended cements underground, or Portland limestone cements, which I'll talk about a bit more, and the increasing use of supplementary cementitious materials. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in the paper, I've already talked about point one. We need to reduce the embodied CO2 in concrete because it's a global issue related to global warming. And I'll talk about Portland limestone cement and why we want to use it. And I'll talk about the synergy of using slag together with that Portland limestone cement. And in 595, Portland limestone cement is called type 1L, with up to 15% limestone. And how does that affect concrete properties? I'll talk to us about sulfate resistance because that's been an issue that's been raised. And I'll show some typical examples if I have time of some uses in uh, infrastructure and building projects. So in terms of North, Portland limestone cements are made from exactly the same components as Portland cement, clinker, gypsum, and limestone, but with about 10% additional limestone. Cements have been allowed to use 5% underground limestone since, well, 10 or 15 years, almost 20 years in some cases, in Canada, almost 40 years, um, as just to help improve the, the cement, reduce CO2 consumption. And now with part limestone cements, they allow up to 15% total in ground limestone that reduces the clinker component. Um, prior to that, the ASTM 1157 performance specification, people have been using limestone cements under that spec in states that allowed its use. And it was used in several interstate projects going back almost 20 years now in Colorado and Utah in particular. In Canada, we allowed Portland limestone cements in 2008 in the cement specification. Um, and in 2011, that happened in um, ASTM and also AASHTO. So ASTM 595 and AASHTO M85. And the way we designed the Portland limestone cement in the specification is they have to meet exactly the same set times and strict development requirements as for the Portland cement they're replacing, the same type. In Canada, we call our equivalent type ones GU, general use, and uh, limestone GUL in the US, it's type one for C-150 cements and type 1L for the limestone in C-595. And fewer raw materials and less energy used to produce Portland limestone cement. So we reduce the CO2, it actually reduces the materials consumption. If you're not sending half of your limestone up into the atmosphere as CO2, the stuff that goes in as underground limestone is not broken down. And when properly optimized, the limestone is not inert and contributes to the properties of the cement. So you're not getting a reduction in cement properties by putting in the limestone. So just to drive the point home, it's exactly the same. A type one or one two cement, Portland cement and ground, is ground in a ball mill like the one shown there. You like to see the insides of a ball mill. Um, it's typically used about 8% gypsum and about 3% limestone. The, the gypsum breaks down, you think about sulfate and cements, that breaks down to a much lower number. So the finished cement has gypsum and limestone. And the only difference here with type 1L cements is that there's more limestone and the gypsum is optimized for that amount of limestone to get optimum performance because the SO3 level in cement has, does affect the performance. And so people do optimum sulfate studies. But because limestone is softer than cement clinker, it preferentially grinds. So the, to get the same clinker fineness as before, the blame fineness of the final cement has to go up because the limestone is increasing the blame fineness because it's softer. And this is just shown here. This is a particle size distribution of several particle size distribution graphs getting smaller on the lower left here and percent passing on the, uh, on the vertical axis. And you see that a Portland cement clinker is that red line and the limestone typically will be much finer. And so the overall blame fineness will go up, get up 
go up if you grind the clinker to the same fineness as it was in the type one cement. That's why the blade, so the only thing you typically see is the blade fineness goes up. But that's to get equivalent performance to meet the spec. So as I said, setting times and strength development are the same with one L cement as with one type one cement. Heat of hydration requirements are the same. The only chemical difference, I mentioned the blame difference, but the only chemical difference is the loss of ignition has to go up because the limestone that's underground, of course, has CO2 in it. And if you do a loss in ignition test by heating it up to a thousand degrees or whatever it is, you will out raise the LOI. So the LOI limit had to go up to accommodate the limestone and cement. It doesn't affect anything else. And we found, and I'll show some data that limestone cement performs at least as well with slag or flash in the mix at the same replacement levels as it did with straight type one cement. In fact, sometimes we get better performance due to the nucleation effect of these fine particles and the additional carboaluminate formation. Now, just sticking with the back in Europe, for, for almost 30 years now, they've allowed um, in EN 196 and 7, which were cement standards and cement test standards, they've allowed up to 20% underground limestone and they call SEM2AL cements. They also allow up to 35% in their SEM2BL cements. They also allow what they call 5% minor additional components, which could be also limestone. So their 20 could be 25, or it might only be 20, et cetera. But the most common cements used in Europe are these limestone cements, and they have been for a long time. Now, this is just some data, um, just showing strength data and uh, calculated porosity data. It was worked by Duncan Herford at Allberg and also um, Thomas Matschei um, did this work together. And what it shows here is, this is relative porosity and strength, porosity in red. Um, oh, sorry, strength in red, porosity in yellow here, versus the percent of limestone in the cement. So if you had straight Portland cement with no underground limestone, you start on the left-hand side. As you add um, limestone up to about 3 or 4%, which is, has been allowed for years, you get your optimum strength and lowest porosity. But as you add more limestone and you get out here to about 11 or 12 percent, even 13 percent, then your strength is back to where you were with zero and your porosity is about the same place. So if you didn't add any limestone and you add say 12 or 13 percent, will vary a little bit, you'll get exactly the same performance as if you didn't have any limestone. And if you add slag to the mix, because what's happening here is you get two effects. You're getting a nucleation effect. The fine part, limestone particles act as nucleation sites for accelerating the rate of hydration, but also you can form carboaluminates from the aluminates in the cement and this, the, 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 the carbonate in the limestone. And you form carboaluminate hydrates, which also fill in space. They're fill, filling in porosity and increasing strength. When we add slag, which has quite a bit of aluminum in it in some cases, you get more alumina to form car more carboaluminates. And you also get the same nucleation effect. So this is a bit of a schematic, but because uh, I don't have the, the final slide, but the strength goes up even higher and the porosity would go uh, even lower when you have more slag, in fact, and you can get to even higher levels of replacement with equivalent performance. So if you stick to 15%, most with Portland limestone cements, they say 15%, but to stay with well below that limit, they typically are targeting 12 in that range, 12 to 13, because they have to stay under 50. So they're going to actually probably improve performance overall. Now, just to show you some concretes, this is some data from a field site, and I have data at other water cement ratios. I'm just going to show you the 0 0.40 mixes, so good quality concrete they would use in, for durability specifications. And as I said, we call our type one cement GU general use. And then what I had showed limestone with 9% uh, limestone and 15% limestone here. And I'm showing you the percent clinker in the total binder. And I've shown it with slag and without slag. So we start with a Portland cement that has about 89% clinker in it because there's gypsum in the 5% limestone. And as we add slag and add limestone cement, we reduce that clinker component. If you use 50% slag with a limestone cement, you've cut your uh, clinker in the binder by about a third, which means your CO2 burden has almost been cut by a third. 
And what you see is the strength data. I've, showed, I've just shown 7, 28, 56 and half a year data. And these are in megapascals, 145 PSI is a me one megapascal, if you don't know that. So 40 MPA is about, 45 is around 6,000 um, PSI. And so if we look at the strengths, all of these, at 28 days, all of these have better strength than the Portland cement control. Um, and at early days, we see even better results with, um, say, 15% with 40% slag here has better strength than um, the Portland cement with 40% slag. An initial 5 MPA, which is about 750 PSI higher if you use the limestone cement with 40% slag versus the straight Portland with 40% 40 slag. So even at early ages, the limestone is interacting, as I said, because of increased carboaluminate formation. And if, in addition to strength, since we're talking about 0 0.40 mixes, if we do the rapid chloride permeability test or the Coulomb test, uh, which is in some specifications, again, for those same mixes, we see big reductions. As soon as you add slag, into the system, you have big reductions in because you're getting uh, more tortuous porosity, more disconnected porosity, and you're getting much lower Coulomb values. And if you're thinking about resistivity, it would be much higher resistivity. So we're getting excellent, they say, and here with limestone, again, I'll go back to that, uh, but we compare the 50%, no, it's just the 40%, 40% slag, the GU 766, 40% slag with the 15% limestone, 438. Both very low numbers, but it's lower with the limestone. So it's consistent with the fact that the strength is higher. Um, there's even some data for precast. I'm not gonna show it all here, but this is one study from one of my colleagues, PhD students, where he did some precast work with type one and type one L cements. And he steam cured them at different temperatures. I'm not gonna show you the 82 degree data here because they're just straight Portland and you shouldn't go there. I'll show you the 55 degrees, which is 131 Fahrenheit, and, and 70 degrees of 158 Fahrenheit accelerated curing. And it shows that even at 16 hours, the strength of the 1L cements here, these all had 5% silica fume, by the way, so just, uh, and 12% limestone in the 1L cement. Better strengths with the 1L cement and silica fume than with the straight Portland and uh, 1L cement at both temperatures. Uh, the temperature at 70 was about the same, but Certainly a big difference at 55 or 131 Fahrenheit. And if you look at 28 days, they're essentially equivalent at 28 days. They've got better one day or 16 hour strengths. And you can see the Coulomb values are essentially the same. Those differences are negligible within the error of the test method. And the freeze thaw durability is essentially the same. In fact, with 1L at 70, it was actually better than with type one. But at 55, they're identical. Drying shrinkage. Um, we did mixtures with um, type one cement, 10% and 15% limestone. And we uh, with, and also those same mixes with slag up to 30%. So what that means is peel 10, 30% slag and 70% of the other, of the cement. So you can see the shrinkage is not affected here. In fact, the, the shrinkage with the slag mixes is, is lower than with the straight cement mixes, but the limestone did not affect drying shrinkage. Um, and this is ASR expansion, some of the uh, paper that actually Jason Weiss, uh, Mike Thomas, and Paul Tennis reported in this PCA report, which is available. You can see in the rapid mortar bar test, this is limestone cement versus partly limestone cement without any SEMs using a reactive aggregate. Actually got a slight reduction in the, in the um, in the uh, mortar bar test, a little increase, but very little. They're both reactive because you're not using anything to mitigate. Um, with the concrete prism test and with this uh, accelerated concrete prism test, which is done at um, a different, it's not an ASTM standard, but it's a, a national standard. You also get about the same performance. So the limestone is not changing anything significantly here. Now, and you can be, mitigate them with the same amount of slag or fly ash ASR with, with limestone cements. Oh, and here's the data to show that. This is the concrete prism test, the 1293 test at two years. And it shows some uh, from Mike Thomas's data showing here's a Portland cement with slag. It's the black line. The blue line is the limestone cement with the same amount of slag. 
it's essentially the same, a little bit less needed with the limestone. And when we use fly ash, it was identical with or without the limestone. If you bring it down to mitigate it down to the expansion limit that we use in the standard. Freeze thaw performance. Some uh, paper that Mike Thomas and I wrote some years ago for the Cement Association of Canada. Um, and it shows that, again, there's no effect with a freeze thaw performance uh, with straight cements and the limestone cements are in yellow bars and the straight Portlands are in blue here with or without slag or fly ash. And this is scaling resistance ASTM 672, but with measuring the mass loss in addition to the visual. And what you see here is there's no difference essentially in the mass loss with or without, certainly with slag, uh, with the um, limestone cement. In this particular case, all these ones are below the limit. The limit we use for mass loss in the in our uh, Canadian standard is 800 grams per square meter. So all these would pass the scaling test, although the slag ones are higher. And that's largely because of the 672 test, not because of real life. And we've shown that more recently, there's better scaling tests to use than 672. But because it's not quite very harsh, especially for SCM mixes that don't have time to mature before they're exposed. And again, this is Coulomb values again same mixtures and show that the limestone is not affecting the Coulomb values and it, it has similar reductions with the SCMs. And these are 28 days on the left, 56 days on the right. I did some carbonation work on some uh, concretes we cast. We stored them at 50% humidity and room temperature for several years, uh, seven years in fact. And you see there's no difference between the mix is ones on the upper left, 15% slag and with and without limestone and the carbonation curve is essentially the same. And what you see here on the lower right is another study uh, where we measure the carbonation depth. Um, sorry, one of the boxes is covered by my text box. But the, the, again, there's no difference with the GU. In fact, the GU L, the green line has the least uh, carbonation of all of them in this study. So essentially you could say, there's essentially no difference in the rate of carbonation because of the limestone being there. There's enough calcium hydroxide and CSH in the concrete to resist carbonation. Okay, now I'll talk about sulfate exposures here. And so there were some published papers. There were some concerns with uh, effective um, low temperature um, sulfate attack leading to Thomasite formation um, in foundations. And people associate that because Thomasite has carbonate in it, people say, well, maybe the carbonate in Portland limestone cement could be a bad actor in this. So we started doing a lot of testing on this going back probably about 15 years now. Um, and what we've shown with long-term tests on concrete, that 1L cements with slag are just as resistant to sulfate attack at low temperatures as one type one cements and slag. And both of them are more resisted than typical type, typically than type five cements that have been allowed forever in foundations. So both etronite and thomasite forms of degradation. So that's the short summary um, on that. But I'll show you some data. Now, where do sulfates occur in the Western US are the most severe cases of sulfate exposure here. Um, they call these uh, salinity soils, but they mean alkali sulfates here. And you can see basically west of the Mississippi, you've got some pretty high sulfates in most parts, parts of the Western US. And some concentrations can exceed 20,000 ppm. And it's very arid so that you, it often concentrates the salts, which is why it's so high there. If you go further north, and you can see just on my upper map there uh, in southern, uh, the Prairie Province of Canada, just directly above that, um, you see this yellow indicates high concentrations of sulfates. And we found in soil samples up to almost 15,000 parts per million in Alberta sort of the worst case scenario. Um, I would say the difference between the previous map and this map is we don't show the United States floating. We show Canada floating with the United States, but Mexico is not, still not there. But anyway, the reason, going back to why we were concerned about this, it was a, uh, an issue back in the UK, you probably remember it, uh, goes back 20 years now, where they were digging foundations for a bridge uh, to do some expansion and they found that the columns in this bridge foundation had deteriorated significantly. You'd almost break it out by hand and 
can see the damage there. And they found out this was due to tomancite sulfate attack. And it attacks the cementitious matrix. And it's relatively unusual, but it's associated with low temperatures and very wet environments that you'd find in some foundations. It's triggered by solubles, carbonates, and sulfates. And the CSH, the calcium silicate hydrates, and the lime are converted to gypsum and tomasite. And the formula for tomasite, you can pick the bottom one here because it's an oxide, it's easier to read. Calcium silicate, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate in the water. And if this thing goes to the end game, completely to tomasite, you end up with, that used to be concrete cubes up in that picture. So you go, well, that's pretty bad. I don't want that. Um, that was work from Building Research Establishment in the UK. Um, so, as I said, both Mike Thomas and I have done extensive studies on behalf of the Cement Association in Canada. We've been doing this for almost 15 years now. We've got concrete, uh, long-term concrete that's been in the ground since 2010 in low temperature environments and heavy sulfate with and without limestone and SEMs. And we wrote a report for the PCA in 2016 I'm sorry, this, the font here is in a funny purple that makes it difficult to read, but that you can download this uh, report for free, cement.org slash PDF underscore files dash SN3285B, blah, 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 PDF, if you want to read the details. But I'll talk about this study. And I had a PhD student, Mike Thomas had a PhD student, my PhD student there, Reza Hani. Uh, Ashley Hossack was Mike Thomas's PhD student working on this. And we, at Toronto, my student passed 53 different concrete mixtures, from 10,010 to 12. They're still being monitored. We have a big underground research site and we have concrete in the labs at five degrees C, which is 40 Fahrenheit. And we did three water cement ratios. We did it with different amounts of limestone in the cement and without limestone. We used type five, three type five cements uh, two type fives with limestone, a type two equivalent moderate sulfate, and a blended cement that high sulfate equivalents. We did different amounts of 40 and 50% slag. We looked at uh, ash, silica fume, and metacholin as well. And we monitored length, mass, and visual inspections. We've done x ray diffraction to look at mineralogical studies. We've done some microscopy in some cases. And we did some other tests you know, for basic concrete properties. I'm not going to show you that. We did the lab testing. We put concrete prisms in sulfate solutions. These are three by three by 12 inch bar uh, prisms um, in the sulfate solutions um, in the laboratory at five degrees. This is just one of the lockers at five degrees. And we did them in sodium sulfate at 15,000 ppm and magnesium sulfate at 15,000 ppm for the 0.4 mixes. Um, and for the higher water cement ratio mix 0.7, we need 1500, which would be moderate exposure in the sulfate exposure tables. We, for comparison, we did put some in lime water just so we had that. Um, this 33,800 is what's in the ASTM C1012 mortar bar test. And in the lab test, we did that initially. We changed it back to 15,000 in the field site. We just used 15,000, which is our worst case scenario we found in soil testing. So for the field testing, which is I'm going to talk, I'll talk about more, we dug an eight foot deep excavation. We lined it with waste concrete blocks to create walls. And we put, put tanks down in there because we don't have sulfate cells. So we created sulfate tanks, put all the concrete prisms, three by three by 12 inch prisms in, loaded them up in either mag sulfate, sodium sulfate or lime water. And we um, stored them there and see a couple of my graduate students uh, working away and we put them underground and we put four feet of styrofoam block thickness of, on top of that. We wanted to keep them cool even in the summer and what we found is by monitoring temperature uh, over the ten, last 10 years that the temperatures varied from about three degrees C which is high 30s in Fahrenheit up to 16 degrees in the summer which is you know, um, about 60 degrees. So it cycles up and down like a normal foundation at the foundation depth. And for the 0.4 mixes, we used 15,000 ppm sulfates, both sodium and magnesium. And for the higher water cement ratio mixes, we used 0.1500. And so the site, when it's all closed up, is covered with a tarp, and it doesn't look like much. We, every year we pull these things out, uh, at least most years we have, to measure them all. And so we've been doing um, 
visual monitoring, and this is our visual assessment that uh, my student Rosa came up with. And we've got excellent concrete weeds. There's absolutely no visual damage indicators. We've done a color code here. Where red is the worst. Yellow is sort of a, just showing the first damage. Green is good. We see tiny little losses at the corners. We call that minor damage. Moderate is the orange here, a little more damage. Um, then moderate, minimum moderate, and moderate with blue. Purple is uh, more severe, and then really severe is we've lost all the surfaces is shown there in red. So I'm going to use that code in the subsequent slides, which is why I'm showing you that. Um, just for fun, I'll show the difference here with um, this is at um, nine months. This is just straight type one cement at 0 0.40 type one cement concrete in the lab in that five degrees C. And we use these concentrated solutions that are in the ASTM C1012 test for the first year. The sodium sulfate, we lost the surface paste. And with the mag sulfate, we saw like a, a skin on the surface and some loss at the corners. And we did x-ray a fraction of the material near the surface after nine months here. This is the x-ray fraction in mag sulfate. And this is straight Portland, type one Portland cement without the limestone. And what do you see here? We see gypsum and we see thomasite, very little etronite. So even without limestone in that cement, we're seeing thomasite formation at five degrees C. So it, you don't need the limestone cement to see thomasite. In fact, we've seen it in type five cements as well. So there's nothing, and what we found is there's no, we didn't see any increased amount of thomasite with the limestone cements, where we didn't see thomasite at all. And we also found from previous studies that if things are going to fail, we typically see etronite first and then thomasite in the damage. Um, so we'd already blown by the etronite part uh, at this point in time. Okay, so I'll just show you some data here on the concrete. And these are after my screen's being blocked here. Um, that after four and a half years, so I don't have the most recent data, but four and a half years here. This is a straight type one cement with 40% slag. It's yellow, it's a tiny little bit of damage. This is sodium sulfate. Um, we have the same limestone cement with 40% slag, exactly the same amount of damage, no difference. Here's a type five cement, much worse damage in that same time frame and the same exposure at the same water cement ratio. So both of these, with or without limestone, blended cements are working better than type five cement in this case. If we up the 40 to 50% slag with the limestone cement, we didn't see any damage. This is a commercially produced equivalent type five with 30% fly ash that's sold, and it showed some minor damage as well. Um, here's some data again, more, uh, this is slag, this is a 10 and a half percent limestone, which is a commercially produced material under the one else uh, spec. They just happen to use 10 and a half with 40% slag and 50% slag again, Minor damage, 50% slag, no damage. Here's two other type five cements, two different type five cements. And we see the same amount of damage after two and a half years in this case um, with the type five cement. So the limestone cement at 40% slag is about the same as the type fives at this point, but 50% slag is even better. Okay, so now I've, this graph shows sodium sulfate on the top row then mag sulfate for mixes that are five and a half years old. Then we've got other mixes down below in sodium sulfate and then mag sulfate at four years because we started them at different times. And what you see here is that, again, there's the 50% slag. Um, I showed you that before. Here's the type five cement. Here's that blended cement. So the same data I showed you before, but here's the same in, in, a, in mag sulfate now. Again, same relative performance a little bit worse in the mag sulfate. We, mag sulfate is more aggressive because it reduces the pH, um, has other effects with, um, in all cases. But again, the slag limestone mixture is performing better than the sulfate resistant Portland cement and equivalent of this blended sulfate resistant cement. Because that's our benchmarks. When you say, well, we're doing this work, what's our benchmark? Because concrete testing isn't, there's no standard for it in ASTM. So our benchmark is, things that we already allow to be used and haven't caused us a problem in the field for the last 75 years, like type five cements or blended cements 
um, that's our benchmark. So what we're saying is these mixtures with limestone cement are producing, performing equal to or better than what we're using now. And again, here's another one, different limestone cement with 10 and a half again versus the two sulfates uh, resistance. I showed you this line before, the sodium sulfate. Here's the same in mag sulfate. So again, it's performing equivalent to or better than the cements we allow now. Okay, here's some happen to be slag plus uh, silica fume. These are four and a half year data. Again, they're all showing good performance at 0 0.40 water cement ratio, whether they got limestone or straight Portland or limestone with the same amount of silica fume. And here's a silica fume slag combination, 25 slag, 6% silica fume, which is quite common. We use for HPC bridge decks in Canada or in Ontario. And it shows it with or without limestone. There's no difference. None of them are getting damaged because so much less permeable. Again, this is a close-up of one of these sulfate-resistant cements after sulfate-resistant cement concrete at 0 0.40 showing the damage. No limestone showing we this more close-up of that damage we're seeing. And just for fun, I, here's three water cement ratios, concrete the three water cement ratios with a type one um, cement no SEM, so it's a type one Portland snow with 12% C3A, it's like a worst case scenario. And you can see the lower concentration at 0.7 and 0.5, but I sort of draw a red box around the original outline of the prism, so you can see that even at 0.4, with the higher concentration that would be represented as very severe, we're getting damage, and in the moderate to low uh, category, we're still even seeing more damage with the higher water cement ratio, so it gets to the point of good quality concrete independent of the cementitious materials. Um, again, here's some other data at 0.4. This is 0.4 versus 0.5. I've shown you the 0.4 mixes on in the top row before. This is 0.5 in the lower concentration. Again, the 0.5, which would be the moderate sulfate exposure. Um, the slag Portland and the slag limestone mixes are performing better than a type two moderate sulfate cement. You can see it's pretty severely damaged, type two. Okay, so summary of all that is that without SEMs, all these Portland cements we use, whether they were type one or type one L, really high C3As, because we tried to take the worst case scenario. They all showed damage, whether they had limestone or not, in both sulfate solutions and at different water cement ratios. But the type five and type five equivalent blended cements also showed progressive damage, not as much, but they're damaged. But the concrete prisms made with SCMs, especially with ones with slag, showed no sign of sulfate deterioration with the higher slag contents, 40 and 50. And slag plus metacalon, slag plus silica fume, and straight silica fume, whether they had limestone or not, the limestone didn't make any difference in their performance relative to straight Portland. Um, and again, the same the, the, with the MS versus at 0.5, we've got the same performance. So the conclusions from all this is that SEMs do a great job of improving sulfate attack resistant, or resistance and sulfate attack. Um, blended cements or SEM blends with whether they have straight Portland or dual Portland limestone cements outperform, in most cases, sulfate resistant type 5 cements. We saw no trend as a function of lime cone stone content in the cements. And we adopted, had originally adopted a low temperature mortar bar test and there've been papers published on it, including by me in 2010. We got rid of it in 2018 because we found the, the low temperature mortar bar tests did not predict performance in concrete that we've seen later. We've actually removed it. We went into the standard and it's out of the standard now in Canada. Okay. And the conclusions from this research report we did for PCA, it's five years old now. I'm about to get the specimens out and do some uh, 10 and 11 year data now. I haven't got there yet because of the COVID restrictions. Um, showed that that mortar bar test was overly aggressive compared to concrete. And um, we did remove the test at five degrees. We've removed any extra requirements. Um, and at ASTM, Limestone cement, again, was added uh, as an option 
one of the cements in 595 and Astro M240 in 2012. Based on this work, ASTM and Astro balloted to permit 1L cements with SCMs and sulfate exposure. The only requirement is that the, the normal ASTM C1012 be, test be passed. And we found that if you, if you have good performance in C1012 for a normal sulfate attack, you will also get good performance of the blends in the low temperature attack based on our concrete work. And in, two years ago, ASTM 318 removed any restrictions on the use of 1L cements and sulfate exposures. As long as you have the test data to perform, to show it. Okay, now I probably, I've got a few more minutes. I'll just show you a couple of examples of where we did some trials. Because when this came on board in Canada, we had to convince our highway department that, um, and some, that it wasn't gonna do any damage. So we started some field trials. And this is one of the field trials. This is some work on a, a high, high wall barrier that was being constructed on a highway in Ontario in 2012. And it shows they were using a high early strength cement with 25% slide or GUL cement, just like type one with 25% slide. And of course the high early had better strengths. Not surprising. The Coulomb values were essentially the same. Spacing factors were good. Durability factors were good in both cases. Scaling losses were fine, less than the 0.8. Um, shrinkage was the same. Chloride diffusion were the same. Um, cylinders, and they took cores out. Again, we got the same data. In fact, we got better strength relationship out of cores out of the actual structure than we did from the cylinders in the lab. And again, there was no issues with the air void contents or the Coulomb values. Okay, next. I got involved with a study with the highway department and one of the construction companies, um, the concrete suppliers in a bar another barrier wall you know, 12 years ago. And we did three truckloads of a, um, limestone cement with 15 slag versus a straight Portland with 15% slag with these barrier walls on a major highway, just on the way between Niagara Falls and Toronto. And it just shows them placing these fairly thick um, barrier walls and commercial crews, um, you know, two and a half to four inch slump, um, three truckloads. And this is just this, the comparison here. When we looked at the data from that, it exactly the same drying shrinkage. This limestone cement slag actually had better one day strengths, equivalent three day strengths, and slightly better, but negligible at later ages. Um, I read through to 90 days. Free stop performance was the same. The scaling performance was the same in terms of mass loss. The Coulomb values were actually better with the, with the limestone cement slag mix than with the straight Portland. Um, we also took compared cores to cylinders here with those mixes. They took cores at 28 days and at 60 days, and we compared them to the cylinder data we had. And again, um, we see the same relationship they're very small differences, some higher, some lower. We did a, some paving on an off-ramp on a, sorry, a major highway, 401 highway west of Toronto. It was being rebuilt with collector lanes, so they put in a multi-lane collector ramp or off-ramp. Back in 2010, we collected data. We did 100 meters of paving with a, with a paving machine limestone cement with 25 slag and a straight cement they were using with 25 slag. Um, three inch, sorry, yeah, three, two and a half inch aggregate, or one and a half inch aggregate, um, and standard pavement width, and 280 millimeters, which is about 11 inches thick pavement. We tried different curing as well, so it shows the paving machine, it's coming out of the paving machine in the final float after the paver, and they did some tining hand tiny on it. Concrete was produced in a central mix plant. It showed air going into dump trucks, which was then fed by conveyor in front of the paver because they had pre-placed dowel baskets in this case. And this just shows the material coming out of the paver. The uh, limestone mix is on the left. It actually seems to be more cohesive than the straight Portland cement slag mix on the right. Seems to be so a paste coming up on the left-hand side in front of the paving machine. As, a, as the auger and the vibrators are working. Um, that orange line demarks the uh, 
straight, the limestone cement on the left versus the straight Portland on the right looks like concrete. We did some testing. So this shows all the different truckloads that were delivered to the site during these tests. They're like um, uh, 13 truckloads of each um, arriving on site. And they monitored the slump, air, and um, temperature on all of these uh, back at the plant, but we didn't have this data when we selected trucks to send for sampling. We did our GUL tests on this mix on the left, on load number 10, and it had um, a higher slump than, a, than some, and the GU tests were done on the one on the right. And so when we tested them, we got slightly different results. The GUL actually had a lower slump. The air content was a bit lower for that particular mix. It wasn't typical, but that, they were bouncing around a bit. Temperature is about the same. Water cement ratio on that particular mix that backed out on that truckload or batch was slightly higher, 0.3435 versus 0.42. And this shows the relative strength, and that's reflected in the relative strengths. Slightly lower strengths, seven days, pretty much recovered at later ages. And the tensile strengths were a bit lower at seven days, but it's at much closer at, uh, well, they're about the same, that's 28. They also did flexural tests. Again, the water cement ratio played into these data. The difference. Okay, in the hardened concrete measure, the hardened air content, or fresh air content, hardened air, you can see there was less hardened air in the, uh, and the spacing factor was about the same though in both cases. Coulomb values were similar both in cylinders and cores, um, cores from cylinders and also cores from the pavements. And the shrinkages were about the same. We did chloride bulk diffusion testing using ASTM 1556, and the GUL mix had slightly higher values at earlier ages, but by 20, 91 days it was actually lower. But again, these differences are relatively small within the variability of that test method. Uh, free stock performance, they were all good, over 90%. Mass loss was all way below the 0.8 limit that they have at the highway department. Um, so we were happy with that. Trial, another trial, we did another slip form job out near uh, Sarnia, Ontario, which is right on the border with the U.S., just uh, Port Huron, I think, is on the Michigan side there. So we did a test barrier with 25% slag with or without 11% limestone. It was late in the season, it was November, so they got salted within a month of production. And again, here's the limestone mix on the right versus the Portland mix, lower Coulombs at 56 days, higher bulk resistivity, um, uh, free slide durability seems about the same, the scaling loss is about the same for those concrete. So I'll just finish up with a couple of, there have been, of course, hundreds of examples since then. In fact, in southeastern Ontario, parts of Western Canada, limestone cement is now the base cement that's being used. It shows a multi-level parking deck at a, um, a shopping mall in Ottawa, 40 to 60% slag with limestone cement, um, pretty large, with up, up to 55 MPA, which is oh, 7,500 PSI, something like that. A stadium that was built in Hamilton, west of Canada, again with different strengths, including some SCC mixes uh, seven or eight years ago now, limestone cement. This is a sewer, a trunk sewer in Hamilton that was, re, it was uh, deteriorating and they re-lined it with a complete reinforced liner um, with UL and 25% slag. Uh, 35 MPA, they had to pump it pretty long distances because of the length of the sewer. And um, they had a shrinkage limit, and they met all the requirements with that. Uh, Precasters have used it in septic tanks, hydro vaults, barrel vaults, block, pipe, uh, and other small products. And nobody's seen the, the producers saying their customers haven't seen the difference. They haven't noticed the difference, other than making the producers had to make small adjustments and admixture doses. Just another example, again, from one company, CRH uh, near Toronto, just a number of projects, condos, condo towers, hotels, um, 
from 20 to 45 MPA, 3,000 to 6,500 PSI concrete. They're just using it in specs. Just in terms of recent extent, this is PCA data as of this month, actually earlier this month, 34 DOTs accept it, which is the dark green here. Um, there's some several states that are planning to accept it later this year, it's believed. And uh, so the map is changing quite rapidly in terms of DOTs that accept limestones and one else cements in their uh, specifications. So in summary, limestone cement and slag can do positive things, re significant reduction in CO2, embodied CO2 associated with concrete and still provide excellent concrete. Early age performance has generally been found to be equal to um, that of straight Portland and slag at the same point. The aluminum in the slag help, helps react with that extra high, finely divided limestone to perform additional carboaluminates, reducing porosity and sometimes increasing early strengths. Same sulfate resistance of one type one in slag is as good as type one L and one L slag, plus slag is the same. And they typically outperform the type five cements people have been using forever. And in pavements, we're getting a roughly equivalent performance with all the different trials. From the contractor's perspective, type one L cement, switching from type one to one L cement should not affect any concrete properties or construction practices. It should be a transparent switch because of the way the specs are designed to give equivalent performance. You get a 10% reduction approximately in, in CO2 reductions, reduction emissions from using that 1L cement alone. If you use 1L cement with 25% slag, which is relatively modest replacement, you can reduce CO2 emissions by a third over equivalent type 1 cement. So I will end with that because we all want green concrete. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Houghton. Uh, I do see that we have a few questions that have rolled in here. Let me make sure we have addressed them all. Um, one, the first one is not a question, but the graphs of embodied CO2 and cost are great. Uh, they tell a good story. So I think those are, I agree, I think those are really, really important to help convey uh, what we're trying to convey here. Um, feel free to, to add any more questions you may have for Professor Hooten in the Q&A box. Um, I think you already addressed this one, Professor, but uh, you may address this in a later portion of your presentation, but can you address whether limestone cements are any different than Portland cement with regard to sulfate resistance, et cetera? I'm seeing concerns from various engineers. Again, I think you addressed that, but I don't know if you want to have any right. other comments. And if, and, yeah, and if you need that PCA report I cited that Mike Thomas and I wrote in 2016 helps answer those questions. It shows that the, um, there is no influence of the limestone when you're properly mitigating concrete by using the white, right water cement ratio for the exposure and using sufficient SEMs with the limestone cement, it has, the limestone has no impact on the result. And I did include that uh, link in the chat box. So if anybody wants a link to that direct report, please feel free to ch check on it there. Um, one, another question, please describe an alternative, the alternative test to ASTM C672 scaling. Okay. The, the highway department here have the MTO is the LS412, which is essentially 672, except they measure the mass loss. What we have in Canada, the Canadian standard, we, we built a better, well, we think it's a better test method than 672. It has some, it came from Quebec and it's now written in the Canadian standard as A23.2-22C, if you like numbers. Um, the main difference is at 28 days, you do the 14 days wet curing, for, you know, first, or first of all, you don't do any final finishing. You discrete it off with a wet wood float and don't touch it again. Because most people, when they use concretes, when they do any final finishing, they don't wait for the fact that there might be a slower set time in some cases with a high SEM mixes. And if you start doing a final finish on SEM mixes prematurely, you're going to cause problems with trapped lead water. Um, and so we don't do any final finishing, so that's the one difference. The other one is that 28 days after the 14 days drying period, we pond the salt solution for a week before we start the freeze-thaw cycle. So some of that salt solution penetrates into the surface, actually reduce the osmotic um, potential. And we see an increased maturity as well for that extra week. But we see huge differences in what we did. We've got several published papers showing that we get much better with that test method, with those changes, we get much better relationship to field performance of sidewalks uh, that we 
had a whole bunch of field sidewalks in Montreal uh, with that. Um, passed versus 672. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, what was the alumina content of the slag used in the sulfate testing? Uh, but varied with the, they're typically in the 8 to 10 percent range. The North American source slags are in that 8 to 10 percent range. And there the several question, years. Uh, another question we have here. Um, in your studies, have you experienced increase in autogenous shrinking using PLC and slag versus OPC and slag, or even PLC versus OPC? I haven't measured it. Um, but autogenous shrinking is not a huge effect. But the concretes I've been talking about, point, you know, point four may be getting close, but it's typically that becomes an issue at lower water cement ratios. Um, but no, I haven't measured any autogenous shrinkage. 